Welcome to another episode of Big Risk Energy. I'm your host, Roy Samuel. I'm a serial entrepreneur, having founded multiple businesses, including one that I scaled and sold to a gaming company in 2018. I've been an investor for the last four years, and I'm also super passionate about neurodivergence, suffering with severe ADHD and dyslexia myself. On this podcast, we talk to an amazing range of people, from academics to actors, entrepreneurs to investors, politicians, musicians, scientists, professional athletes, and everyone in between. And we talk to these people about risk, risk they've taken in their lives, risk they've taken in their careers, how those paid off and when they didn't. And on today's episode, we are blessed to be joined by the one and only Pierce Linney. Pierce is an entrepreneurial force to be reckoned with. He's an ex-dragon from BBC's Dragon's Den. He sat on the board of the British Business Bank and he's currently the co-founder of technology company Moblox. Pierce, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. So Pierce, you've done it all. You've had an amazing career, incredibly varied, working in interesting businesses, building interesting businesses, media, TV, all these things. But what I want to know is where does it all start? Where does your relationship with risk and entrepreneurialism begin? So I think people often ask you, don't they, is it sort of, a, you know, do you learn it or is it something which is you're born with? And I think that to some extent you're born with a, an element of your risk aversion. I think that can be trained out of you. I think leaders can be um, built as well. The army trains leaders, that's what they do for a living, basically. But my, my interest in business, which happens to involve a lot of risk, came from the need to, which drives a lot of entrepreneurs, actually, to have nice things. So when I was um, 13, 14, I wanted a Curtis Expert BMX made out of T45 alloy. And it was about 400 quid. This is like 1983, right? It's an expensive bit of kit. And I, I was doing a paper round. So every, every, I got paid five pounds a week, shows how old I am, for doing six days a week, delivering at you know, six in the morning till eight in the morning, whatever the hell it was. And um, I thought, this is a mugs game. So my dad one morning said to me, uh, one Sunday morning, which they didn't deliver the papers. He said, um, go and get the paper so I don't have to get out of bed. Because when I grew up in the north of England, when it snowed, you didn't see, you covered your car, basically. So he said, go and get the paper. So I did, went down to my, my not so cool BMX, got the, got the paper, came back. He gave me the money for the paper. Actually, I don't know, he'd already given me that. And when he gave me a tip, so you can see where this is going. Yep. So I fly the whole neighborhood, build a paper around business. The papers weren't delivered by news agents on Sunday. So I bought them wholesale from the, from the wholesaler. I disintermediated the local news agent. At the How age old are you at this point? 13. Yeah. And then I, but I didn't think anything of it then. You just go through the problem solving process, don't you? Yeah. Where do I get the papers from? Where's the news agent to get the papers from? Ring them. The first they said, no, they wouldn't deliver. And then my dad said, you know, well, why not? It's a pretty big order. And they delivered. And I delivered these papers and I made 20 quid on a Sunday morning. And I had a deal with my parents, actually. It was kind of like, you know, if you, if you make half, we'll put in the other half. Okay. Lots of different things. So I got my, I got my Curtis BMX. Um, and that was my first exit. <laughs> so when it became, when I got older, I wasn't doing it on a bike. I had a car. When it became uncool to have a paper out, yeah. even though I was making quite a lot of money out of it, because I built it up from that, I sold it. I can't remember what it for now. The number in my head is 200 quid. So it's, my, so it's my first exit, actually. Not a great multiple <laughs> on an annualised basis. <laughs> but uh, I got out and... Um, they all count, Piss. they yeah, all count. But what I learned was, going back to your question is, if you see a problem and you find a solution to it and you, you keep your end customer happy, B2C or B2B, and you add value to their life or their business, they'll pay you for it. Mm. And then the missing bit, which a lot of people forget about, is you put in a lot of hard work and you can create some value, some wealth, in a very small way, but that stuck with me. And then from then on, I was you know, doing door-to-door -door sales, right. selling those perfumes, smell similar to other perfumes. I didn't realize you did that. Yeah, wow. I did a better way. You, know, yeah. you, have, you have Amazon there. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, I was like a, a very tiny Amazon. <laughs> and uh, so you did a better way, it was called. I delivered pots and pans and yeah. stuff to help an old lady open, a, open a, a jam jar, all this stuff. So I did that. I did a sort of perfumes at university, no, no, sorry, parties at university, company formations at law school. Because that, that was one of the things I was going to ask you about, because obviously, you know, incredibly entrepreneurial from a super young age, and then you go and study law. So I guess that you're, you're studying law, but you're also scratching that entrepreneurial itch by running things on the side whilst you're there as well. Yeah, I'm not a huge believer in leave school at 16 and start a business. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really, really goes well. 
Um, most people, I think, is it the, I think the average age of a tech entrepreneur is now in the 40s. Really? Yeah, somewhere yeah like I'm that. not surprised. I read that somewhere. But um, so, so my dad was working class Mancunian lad, who my mum was a Bayesian, Barbados, came over to be a nurse, NHS, proper Windrush generation, 1963. And um, my dad went to Cambridge. In those days, you went there and you came back. <laughs> you didn't get to join the club. But I was expected to go to university. Mm. Um, so I was thinking about, oh, well, I want to go into business. What should I study? And all my neighbours, you know, Eddie had, a, Eddie had a, a building business, Graham had a quarry. They're all kind of trades people, really. And Derek had a joinery business. They said, um, and my parents too, do an accounting degree, which is probably the worst advice. Because no one around me knew really about business. So I had to learn the hard way, which is, I didn't have that, we'll talk about it later maybe, that social capital. Yeah. So I didn't have that. I had to sort of um, create it and build it myself by being inquisitive and uh, sort of blinkered and quite determined. That's a really fascinating term and I, let's dive into it because I think it's, it's something which is so important to uh, talk about with, you know, from the 80s, how much things have changed now. So let's talk about social capital. I mean, it'd be great for you to explain what, what does social capital mean for those who don't so, know? Social, so I'm a big believer in this continuum of having social capital, which helps you create economic capital, which eventually becomes political capital, and it goes around the circle. So social capital is who you are, really, where you grew up, what postcode you grew up in, what your parents did, how much money they earned. Um, did your parents inherit a house from their, their parents and did their parents inherit from their parents their money that's come down the, the kind of the, the chain over, over the years? And, you know, it's what if ethnicity your parents, mm. what's your socioeconomic background? It's these things that if, if it's kind of there, and there's different facets to it, but you have this kind of foundation almost, Life's a lot easier. You've got a springboard. You've got people to talk to. You've got access to that first couple of thousand pounds you want to start your business. Well, if you're lucky, that first, you know, there's tens of thousands of pounds. Uh, the, the amounts of friends and families around I hear of, which are close to a million, it's like, okay, you, know, well, I mean, you can that, tell it's a very different friend yeah, and family around, right? That's economic capital. <laughs> it's not social capital. So it makes a difference. So, you know, if, if you come from a particular background, you don't realise it. They call it privilege, whatever you want to call it, which is what it is really. But if you don't, you know, trying to get going, trying to do these things and take risk is very hard. So I always say that ambition is evenly distributed. It's actually not evenly distributed. If you look at ethnic minorities, people who are neurodiverse, they're probably more indexed more to those people who start businesses because they hit ceilings or don't think they can have a career or they struggle to get into the jobs they want to do, so they start a business. So if ambition is evenly distributed, why isn't the top of society like the same? Why is it that only one black woman founder raised uh, over a million pounds in VC in between the last 10 years up to 2019, it's whatever insane. the stats are? It's insane. So I was on the board of British Business Bank, did a lot of research about this. So you've got, to, you've got to connect ambition with opportunity. And to go back to social capital, the key ingredients are access to capital, mm -hmm. networks, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and sort of guidance, really. And that can kind of come from networks. Um, so if you have those three things, you're more likely to go into business. Your risk appetite might be the same, but your ability to go and take on risk mm. um, by actually executing, because you know, ideas are cheap, um, is massively dependent on your social capital. And then when you make money, that's economic capital. Yep. So where are we now in the state of social capital? How much have things improved? Because you know you still see some of these stats where the amount of VC funding going to founders of colour is shockingly low. I think it was really like 1.3%, something like that, and maybe even lower. How, how have you seen things improve? Are we getting better at this? Is this something which a lot of people are paying lip service to, but not enough is being done? How do you assess things right now? I mean, there's more awareness of the issue, um, but it's not really getting better quickly. I think if you say 1.3%, that's probably the US. Mm, yes, yeah, it was the US. In the yeah. UK, it's way below half a percent, way below. So. There's awareness of it. There's funds, there's underrepresented founder funds. I keep knocking on their door. I don't know if my presentation is rubbish. Well, <laughs> no one's bitten, no one's bitten yet. Uh, I think one, one angel, I think, is going to. So the, the idea is there, and it, and it started with kind of women. Um, you know, George Floyd's murder has raised the awareness of, you know, probably black ethnic minority, Asian founders as well. So you see more funds. The US is quite different. Um, that really has moved on leaps and bounds over the last few decades or so. The UK is still trying to catch up. 
but there's not a lot of, I mean, there's not a huge amount of capital to focus on underrepresented founders. I don't just mean ethnically either. It can be someone who's females actually, we know we're diverse. So it's going to take time for that to filter through. So but two things need to happen. The LPs mm -hmm. need to say, well, I expect to see, because mm -hmm. if you take my, if you take my, my approach that if ambition is evenly distributed, then the capital and the incidence of people of, from those minorities being funded should, should represent their, the percentage of them in society. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Probably index more to them, actually. Yeah. Uh, and that's not happening. And when you were on the board of the British Business Bank, did you see there was genuine appetite and desire for change at that level? Yeah, so British Business Bank is the UK Government Development Bank. Um, so we, we put out, I think it was 90 billion during COVID. So the bank itself, the people in the bank are very mission driven and they absolutely want to see that happen. I mean, partly why I'm on the board, you know, I sort of tick boxes, I suppose. And uh, I always champion entrepreneurs and small businesses especially. So there's a, there's a desire to do that. Um, there's a lot of research, a lot of talk about mm -hmm. it, but as you all know, talk's cheap. You've actually got to make things happen. And until, as I was saying, the LPs need to sort of push, which they are, the government's an LP essentially yep. in that case. Um, but also one of the issues is, and I'm on the diversity inclusion board at Sky oh, in right, the UK. Yeah. So Sky's um, got 28 million subscribers, 33,000 employees. Wow. Um, known by a large US media yeah. group as well. So it's interesting at Sky that in, in employers use lots of techniques to remove conscious and unconscious bias when they're hiring recruiting people. Interesting, what sort of techniques do they so use? So things like where they'll train you, you'll watch an interview, uh -huh. but the people have been masked out. Like, like in, literally like in a video edit. So when they're chatting away, you make assumptions, you make notes, yeah. and then they show you who they are, and it could be, a, you know, and, and change their voices. Yeah. It could be a white woman, an Indian guy, and you think, oh, hang on a minute. And you, make, you, you come up with a different outcome. Wow. Because you're unconscious bias. Wow. If it's, un if it's conscious bias, then you, you just- That uh, must be quite shocking when you see that in, in real time, where you're seeing the, yeah, oh, yeah, that, that um, uh, you know, uh, unidentification. Hey, we've all got it. Yeah. It's all bu it's built into us. You know, yeah. Disney, you know, Pocahontas, everything it's drilled into us. I remember watching a TV programme, uh, the news, a while ago, I might remember this, and this, new, this guy's on the news, he's a white guy, ex-banker, he's talking about the ec economy, and some little, little baby of his runs in behind him, one of those sort of toddler wheelie things, and some Asian lady runs in behind him, picks a toddler, and picks exactly it up, talking about. runs out, and you're I was thinking, oh God, he's got a nanny. Yeah. He's got a nanny, it's his oh, yeah. wife. So I remember exactly. What you're even I'm about. like, oh, no slap. Yeah. But it's built into you, so you shouldn't feel bad about it. But the fact you're aware of it's quite important. So the point though is, is that when you get into venture, especially, and venture is quite a rarefied place to raise money. Let's face it. In terms of, you know, you, you've got to be a kind of business that's going to exit. Most businesses are never going to raise venture capital. But the investment committees. So you might have a range of scouts and people out there mm. down the street meeting people, making moves. We get to the investment committee, there's a load of white guys. So that's got to change as well. Really, really interesting. And your desire to see this change, how much does that influence, you know, things you're doing now with Moblox, trying to democratise much fairer contracts for business. How much is that part of your why? So my, yeah, so I've been, I've been involved in most technology, telecommunications and the convergence of the two. And people always call me a tech entrepreneur, but really I've been an enterprise integration entrepreneur. Not really, right. Doesn't, doesn't quite ring off the mouth in the same way, yeah. <laughs> Not quite. Oh, I, we've got to, I want to write some code to create the solution and will it into existence. I'm more, you know, bolting things, going APIs for large corporates. So Moblox, the, the, this business, the new one, new business, is really me. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a champion of entrepreneurship, innovators, small businesses. I worked in a small, especially small businesses. I worked in a small business channel for many years and they're just ripped off. It's used car sales techniques, you know, they'll tell anything you want to hear to earn a commission so they can make a commission because they sit between the end customer, mm -hmm. the small business, and the telco or the large service provider. <clears throat> and they're just, it's, and I thought, I can't believe it hasn't changed since I was in that game 10 years ago. And I liken it to the neobanks. So the neobanks were, what they've done is disrupt traditional banking. So traditional banking sits on, you know, the, the, the existing rails, back, swift, it's all there. And they've taken, scraped off that awful customer experience, charge you 25 pounds, going one pence into your overdraft, or if you didn't have an overdraft, it's even more money. Scrape that off, yep. put something in place which is customer centric, software driven, app driven, easy to do. 
And you can do that in telecoms. So you've got the existing infrastructure, the network, scrape off the telco, who are even worse than the banks, actually, yeah. in terms of legacy systems, process, infrastructure, culture, scrape them off and put in place a new solution, customer focused, software driven, based on an app that allows you to reduce costs as well. Because if you're a small business provider or an entrepreneur, as you are as well, how many times have you wasted you know, buying a solution you don't understand? Yeah. Um, it's cost you more money. If you're a small business or an entrepreneur, you get charged more for mm -hmm. a business contract. So we don't do that. I mean, I signed up my first customers recently. He's got seven, seven employees. We sold him seven, 2,800 pounds just on the data before I even get into leasing devices. So we're trying to save people money. But what I'm trying to do really is say to small business and entrepreneurs, I want to help you generate more revenue yep. and reduce your costs. And, and in the middle, it's profit margin. And surely now with everything going on, and I want to get your view on the economic downturn and what that means for people taking risks in small businesses, but surely now more than ever, this is a great time to be entering that market. Yeah, it is. So not if you want to raise capital. <laughs> so it's, sure. It's always two on sides, the, on like the commercial cool. traction yeah. side, in terms of serving yeah, the no. needs of those customers who every small business right yeah. now is trying to totally. do everything they can to reduce yeah. costs. So they're all, you know, you're looking at... So if you've got a job, right, you can complain, you can go to your union, you might even go on strike, which is one of the reasons I was slightly late here today. <laughs> you might go on strike because you want a pay rise, yeah. like right? could be 2%, inflation's 10, you might get 10 if you're lucky. If you're an entrepreneur or small business owner, what you're seeing is, is your costs are going up, and it might be labor, it could be yeah. inputs, whatever that is, electricity, anything. If your costs are going up. Uh, you probably, in most cases, don't want to, can't pass that on to your end customer because they're taking a hit on their pay yeah. income as well. In a lot of cases, you're just afraid to. So what's happening, your margin's getting squeezed. So you're taking a hit, actually. Especially in a small business, that margin is, it's what drives your income, what puts food on the table. Um, so your profits are going down, your income's going down, your dividends are going down, yet the cost of the cost of living is going yeah. up. So you've got this perfect storm, this pincer movement. Absolute squeeze. Where they're, they're getting squeezed in the middle really badly. So anything you can do to help them, um, as I'm concerned, is a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you assess risk right now? Has it changed the way that you're looking at investing, the way that you're investing as a company, as an individual with, with this downturn? Have you, have you personally felt that your risk appetite has changed? Well, it just changes as you get older. So I'm older than I look. <laughs> so I'm 51, actually. God. And, and, um, and I always say to younger people, probably 20s, early 30s, do it now. Yeah. Before you have mortgages, car insurance, some stupid watch that you can't really afford, you know, uh, you want to go on some holiday that you can't really afford, just take risk early on yeah. before you have obligations and you know, in the nicest way possible, they're balls and chains. And, I have a lot of people who I, I'm a lawyer by training, so my, my, personal, my personal approach to things, my personality, and you know me a little bit now, is, probably, is a bit shoot from the hip. Mm -hmm. I'm quite mm -hmm. personable, I want to get things done, charge, I'm the guy that will kick in the door and throw a grenade in and charge <laughs> in. Um, whereas what being a lawyer and a banker did is sort of train me when I need to, yeah. to sit on the hill yeah. and be a sniper. So if I need to, I can go through a document that big. I can write a very complicated financial model. I can do detail, but that was kind of trained into. Mm. Um, now, as you get older as well, flipping back to that, and you've got children, responsibilities, um, ability to take risk, but you start thinking beyond your life. So I'm working now, not really for me. I don't need more stuff, quite frank. You can only, you can only be in one room yeah. at a time. <laughs> so that's what, that's what I've also learned. And I've, I've had all the flash cars. I've now got a Jakarta van conversion, which is a pro master if you're in America. <laughs> so, that's a proper family man that's, car. That's, yeah. It's my yeah. time, a van conversion. So, yeah, but you know that if you wanted a flash car, you can just go and buy one. So it kind of loses its interest. But the point is, is that the material things become less important. I'm more thinking now about the, the, the kids, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that changed your perspective on risk as well. But I've never, I've never been one for, people often say to me, I'm in risk, I'm in wealth creation mode, now I'm in wealth preservation mode. Mm -hmm. I've, never crossed, I've never crossed that Rubicon. I'm always in wealth um, creation mode, I suppose. But over time, you, you have to learn as an entrepreneur and you make a bit of money, mm -hmm. is to put some of it away. Yeah. Because the danger is, you think you're invincible, you think you're clever, and you think, oh, hang on, I put it on red at one, 
I put it on red again and I won. You put it on red again and you know it's, the inevitable will happen. So it's, it's always coming, it's always coming. If you look at the markets at the moment, moment it's coming real fast right now. I made that mistake. Yeah. yeah. I, well, because that's it, because you've been there, you've had it, you've lost it, you've yeah, come back. Yeah, I've, I've um, made money. I've got lost all my money. <laughs> but, you, but you've done things where you thought, oh, this is going quite well. Yeah. And you keep, keep sort of doubling down on it. And then, it, you know, you, you end up losing your shirt, basically. Yeah, which is painful, which is painful. And how, how have you, because a lot of the, the people we have in this show are maybe at the earlier part of their career. So there's two actually interesting things I want to ask you about. One is picking yourself back up, you know, after a loss, brushing yourself down. What, what's, what's your mindset there? How do you, you know, get ready for another battle? As you said, you're 51 now, you're still absolutely in creation mode. How do you, you know, get yourself back into it after, after taking a hit? So if you're watching this and you're thinking of starting a business, or you've started one recently, the voices you're hearing in your head are not yours. It's your family, it's your friends, it's your parents, it's your former colleagues at work. And when you say start a business, most of them projecting, because they want to do it, but they haven't got the risk appetite or the kahunas, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> to do it. So the, the, the thing that holds people back is, are those voices. And when you start a business, it's, everyone's, they're absolutely determined, but they think this is going to be it. The first one is the one that's going to make them. Mm -hmm. That's not usually the case. You might make some money, you might not. You might lose your shirt, you might go out of business, you might lose shareholders' money, and you know, they came on the journey with you. And you know, you've got to understand that they should understand that risk. Um, but then you will learn. And serial entrepreneurs are serial entrepreneurs because, not because they're any particularly better at understanding how to conceptualize something and, and go to market with it. What they're good at is avoiding all the potholes and mistakes yeah. that we all made on the way. So they're, they're executing, they're slicker, there's less friction to get to where they want to be. It still might not work out, but there's less risk, going back to risk. So if you start your business, don't listen to those voices in your head. A lot of them are just projection. Yeah, and I think when you're launching your first business, you need a healthy bit of delusion. Because ultimately, the first time you do anything, you've got no experience, right? So there's got to be that utter self-belief, you know, eternal optimism. But I think you do need a bit of healthy delusion as well that it is going to be the big one, right? Because that's the thing which drives you on. Then when you're in the, the second time, third time founding a business, you know the ropes, you know what you're going to do, you're much more polished. But I think you do need to have that delusion of this is going to be the big one in order to, to really push you through. And I also think um, one of the things you speak about a lot is that sacrifice, that hard work that you mentioned before. I think there's a big trend at the moment, lots of LinkedIn influencers, lots of people on LinkedIn glorifying entrepreneurialism. Uh, a lot of people saying, you know, go be a founder, go do that. And I think that's, that can be a great thing, but it's, it's not for everyone. So talk to me a bit about what hard work has looked like for you and, and that sacrifice. Well, I mean, if you're from the UK, you're watching this, you'll probably understand a bit more, understand this more, but I, I grew up in a small Lancashire mill town. This is where the Industrial Revolution started about 100 years ago, and not much has happened since, <laughs> to be honest with you. And I went to a terrible school, although I still go back there and do my bit when I can. And um, I, was, I wanted to go and work in the city and be a lawyer. And people said to me, literally, people like you don't get jobs like that. You know, it's just, you know, I know, I know that's your ambition, but you don't want to set your sights too high, because mm. you'll just find yourself, you know, you'll, 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 you're not going to make it. <clears throat> and I didn't listen to anybody. Um, so I worked very, very hard. And then when I eventually got into, got my chance, got into law, um, which is another long, different podcast, how <laughs> I got into law, um, I then decided I didn't want to be a lawyer. Because I wanted to be, I was a venture capital, mm -hmm. I was in a venture capital firm. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually quite a handy VC lawyer myself, uh, even though I didn't stay very long. That's all I did when I was there. And my mentor was a VC lawyer. So I, I wanted to be the, the fund manager, or the entrepreneur doing the deal in front of me, yep. not the person writing it up. So I said to my friend at the time, oh, that's what I want to do. I want to do finance. Goes, you should go into investment banking. And I said to him, I'm making this up. What is investment banking? <laughs> I never clue. Always a good start. So going my social capital, <laughs> yeah. I had no idea. When I started my law degree, I had no idea what the difference in the UK was between a barrister and a solicitor. When I was at banking, this was at Credit Suisse versus Boston, right? This was yeah. like back in the day when the in the early, early, 1999, 1997, 2000, they're the boom. They were good days. And um, 
I was earning a fortune, but I had no idea what investment banking was when I was a corporate lawyer. I had no idea what a hedge fund was when I was an investment banker. And I meet young people now, they've got this roadmap, they yeah. understand all this yeah. stuff. So I, I had to work, not just hard, to prove myself. Always a slight chip on my shoulder. Um, but I also had to just work hard on understanding the context of what the hell all these people are talking about. It was interesting, I, I did a program called The Secret Millionaire in 2011, mm -hmm. which is a bit like Undercover Boss. Yeah. You go into a community and you pretend you're somebody else and, and then you suddenly come out and you give money to charity, basically. And I spent um, a lot of time in the town in, in, well, so in the program, I, when it went out, I was driving around my old town, actually, yeah. in my Porsche Cayenne at the time. And my phone lit up, all my ex-banker mates, saying, I never knew that you grew up in an awful, I see you said this, really? an awful town like that, and you went to an awful school like that, and I'm kind of like, well, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. I said, but um, you never asked me. Yeah. So I, I, I burn a lot of time and energy, what they call in diversity inclusion circles, covering. Mm. So pretending that I wasn't quite, I wasn't really the person they thought me was. Mm. I was trying to be somebody that I probably wasn't. And I was quite good at that. Yeah. Um, I could get the stripy suits, I did the whole thing. But that wastes a lot of energy and you shouldn't have to do that. So would you say that Secret Millionaire Programme 2011 was a real turning point then, or was that something you'd already started incorporating into, you know, being a, a more fuller version of, of giving your background out, as it were? And I was asked by the government to be a, a role model for young black men and boys at the time in 2008. Mm -hmm. And I remember being approached, and I, I remember thinking, why are they asking me? Because I never thought about it. I was just, I blinkered, just getting on with it, just doing stuff. I never thought, is there anybody like me standing around me? And there usually wasn't. I mean, I, I even, even after I've been on TV, I was in a meeting with, um, I was doing a deal basically. There's lawyers, accountants, and people in the room. And I turned up quite early. So I'm sat there, everyone's turning up. And they're all filing the nails, looking out the window, texting their mom, updating Instagram. And uh, I remember saying, are we gonna start this meeting? And they'd all look at each other and go in here with peers. Wow. And they never expected peers to wow. like me. I was a, a finalist in quite a big... Um, so how long ago was that? Uh, this is not, this is, this is, 20, this is post 2015. Wow. I mean, that's been on TV by then. Yeah. Um, but there's people there that we didn't quite clock it. But the interesting one, I won't well, win. I was a regional finalist, so nowhere near winning, <laughs> in an entrepreneur competition by one of the big accounting firms, which you will know. Yep. And I went to the, this, this uh, sort of dinner, and I, uh, it was like a award ceremony basically, and I walk in, they make a makeshift cloak room, put your coat and bag behind it. I go and do that. And as I'm walking out, two of the finalists gave me their coat and bags. So I brush these things off. I find it quite funny. But if you're from a certain a minority, these are what you call microaggressions. Yeah, of course. And they can build up over time and they wear you down. Uh, and that's when you can find it harder to take risks because you don't want to stick your head above the parapet. Mm. And do you find now it's much easier to brush it off, obviously achieving what you have before? Have you always been someone who can do that? I don't care now. What's interesting with me is, I have to say, I mean, I've made a bit of money, right? I've lost money, but I'm no billionaire. But I hang out with some billionaires sometimes and um, and very wealthy people. And, and the thing is about being a, a former dragon or a shark on Shark Tank in the US is that no one, you can't buy that. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so they were like, oh, well, uh, well, I was asked to do that. And I said, no, I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> so it's an, it's an interesting thing that the, the, the BBC yeah. sort of gave me is that it has great power, it opens doors, people take your call. Mm -hmm. um, the flip side, of course, is they, they create a caricature of you. It's not really you. Uh, this sort of like, this entrepreneur was, I'm still... That, that I'm still in the game, really. Yeah, you're still hungry. Like, yeah. I feel it every time we speak, like, you know, you've got that driving passion that you do of building, and you know, which is so different to how people see it on Dragon's Den when you're on that side yeah, of the it's table. It's like you, right? you arrived and you turn yeah. up in the back of a Maybach or whatever it is, and you know, but um, you know, during just before COVID, we started Atherton Bikes, so 3D printed, additive manufactured titanium mountain bikes made out of titanium and carbon, and you know, it, that we crowdfunded about yeah. 600k and then we 
raised probably 600K from angels. And it took a while to find the product market fit yeah. in terms of who the real customer was for these yeah. things. But now it's killing it. You know, We've got a, a laser printing machine that's working around the clock. Yeah, well, that's uh, a really awesome that, thing. That was about a hobby. That was yeah. the, turned into a business. And that's a really awesome thing about that business as well is you know, when you look at it, it's obviously, it looks great, like the product's fantastic. And what we've won, Four World Cup podiums this were Exactly that. But when you actually look at the technology behind it, what I've seen is it's Dan, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I've speaking to Dan recently, like just understanding actually the level of technology behind it is it's insane. A real, it's a real deal. So I find that that's my first foray into manufacturing. Right. Uh, and that's, then that's, those bikes are made in Wales and the UK, mm -hmm. in one of the regions, which is great. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of spreading it out, trying to level it up a bit. But um, I, will, I will, if I, the money I make going forwards, Ideally, it's obviously got your family in that, but it's to reinvest yeah. or give away. And are you, so I, I saw something recently, Gary Neville talking about only wanting to invest in Manchester, in the surrounding areas, because he was passionate about that. Is that something that you're passionate about in terms of bringing out, you know, more regional diversity in that way? Well, I tend to be networked in the regions anyway. Mm -hmm. So I grew up there. Mm -hmm. uh, I lived in I lived in the northwest of the UK during COVID and all that kind of, so I'm kind of networked there anyway. So I probably come across opportunities across the board. Yeah. Um, one of the big ones is, um, I've talked about Sen as well. So Sen is, uh, so get this one. So this was a good friend of mine <clears throat> when he was uh, 18 years old. He had the vision of space TV, like the CNN for space. You know? Okay. Anyway, so last year, 2020, where are we now? 2021, no, it's 2022, January this year, he saw his first satellite go up on SpaceX. Wow. And now he's in his 50s. Amazing. So what we're building, or he's building, should I say, is a constellation of satellites of 8K cameras with real-time video of all of Earth. Wow. Now that's a game changer. Yeah, I mean, that's in awesome. In so many weird and wonderful ways. And that fascinates me. So what's the, what's the like, vision for that project? I mean, that's such an incredible project. Well, it's one of those things where, where there are so many applications for it. Yeah. Ed tech, education, trading, insurance, finding forest fires, counting wow. whales, humanitarian. So what you're really creating, all he's really creating is a data stream. How that will be used will be, you know, independent software vendors just go, yeah. oh, well, we could use it for this. Yeah. And writing code against it. And yeah. It, it's a fascinating, and That's I think amazing that technology. it's a game changer. Yeah, really interesting. I could talk to you about space all day, yeah. but we so won't. space, the interesting, so, so I've got bike, space, yeah. small business. Yeah. Um, it all interests me. That's great. So let's go back to Dragon's Den. Obviously, it sounds like a life-changing experience. I mean, did you really see how much that did open doors, change the way that people look at you just, you know, completely break down barriers in a way that, that, that you've never had before? It's quite weird. So I was, I was a secret millionaire. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a program on Channel 4 in the UK. And then I was approached to Dragon's Den. And um, there's a good story to this, which we should, I should definitely share. Let's do it. So I was uh, away with Sir Richard Branson, yep. as you do, on safari with him. Okay. At his Ulusaba private game reserve in the Kruger National Park in South Africa. Amazing. And it's like a James Bond lair. It's like all flat bush, and then you've got this like, rocky outcrop with his six-star hotel on it. And Insane. And dish. <laughs> Insane. So I remember, and I was being chased by the producer of Dragon's Den. I thought you were going to say chased by one of the, the animals on the reserve. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Rich is quite nuts. He'll chase you around with a corona. <laughs> so, but he, he was, and they were chasing me, saying, you're going to do Dragon's Den? I wasn't sure. You know, I'd done, Secret Millionaire was quite transient. What was your off. apprehension? Because I'd done Secret Millionaire and I was, I was famous for 15 minutes. Yeah. And Dragon's Den was different. I mm. was, you know, it was, who knows, I did it for two years. Yeah. But who knows? It was a different thing. And also I was very busy. I was running mm. a business. So who can I talk to about business, the media, how you mix the two together, how the, the pros, the cons, you know, obviously. So I ended up in a conversation and this is no found a story that reverse engineered. Yeah, this is how yeah. it went down, right? <laughs> and we're having a Corona beer on this rocky outcrop. And he was saying, what's up with you? And I told him, and he goes, oh, right, really? I goes, yeah. And he said, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. He said, back in the day, if I got a, um, even now, actually, if I got a decent news spot, I'd get on a plane. He said, don't, you know, the power of media. He said, so, you know, screw it, just do it. Of course, he would say. Of course. And I said, thank you very much. Got up and walked away. And he goes, I'll come back here. And he said, ring them now. And I was, so you got to <laughs> ring the producers back and tell them I was in. So that's how I ended up on Dragon's Den. That's amazing. Um, so I, I was a kind of a, apart from my slight wobble there, I was more of a yes, 
to do these things. And literally it was, right, okay, you're in, sign a contract. Mm -hmm. First day, turn up, bit of makeup, sit in a chair. Hello, Deborah, hello, Peter. Oh, out of lights, actions, camera, that was it. Amazing. It was just boom, and just, you just get on with it, don't you? And after that, things change in a, in a new way in terms of more ability to You're famous, media. aren't you? Yeah, so I'm, I'm sort of, I forget, right? And my, it's funny now because I, I follow your Instagram. I get to see all the good stuff you get up to. It's, it's it so looks do, a lot do, of fun. Do you get to do that? that? You yeah. get to do stuff that would never happen. I had dinner the other day in the uh, the tropical biome of the Eden Project. I saw that. It looked came. incredible. The only other people I've had dinner in there was the G7. Yeah, amazing. So stuff like that you get to do is amazing. And um, so I, <clears throat> so I said yes, and then but it just changed your life, but. I try to use it for good. So my former uh, chairman, uh, Sir Ken Alyssa, a bit of a mentor, he said, you can go celebrity, you can go to the opening of a fridge, of an envelope, or whatever you want to do, or keep it serious. So I became a trustee of the UK's largest um, innovation foundation, mm -hmm. Leicester, it's a 500 million foundation, board of the government bank. So I've kept it kind of serious, which has meant I don't get invited to as many sort of uh, cool things, but I think that's quite important. So I've tried yeah. to use that profile for good. I was B2B, yeah. so being on TV doesn't really help you sell stuff, yeah. to be honest with you. You know, if I had a shirt shop, it helps. Um, I think with um, my new business, Moblox, most entrepreneurs in the UK, um, the six million businesses in the UK, mm -hmm. four million are sole traders, wow. or consultants or contractors. That many sole 70, traders? 70, wow. 75 percent. Wow. I've got one person. So now it would be good to be on TV, yeah. um, but I try and use that. My the experience and the profile to do good. So I was doing this stuff for free, really. And then just before COVID, I get asked for business advice everywhere. Not that I have all the answers either, but I can at least give, say something sensible or tell you where to look. And I was frustrated by entrepreneurs asking me the same questions. And I thought, there must be a way on the internet, some way you can go and find this stuff. So I did some research. It's as you said earlier, it's, it's kind of getting, it's more ask the universe, yeah. straight line growth, 10x this, you've seen it all, haven't you? And I was like, this is utter BS. Entrepreneurs <laughs> need to I'm glad know. you're saying this and people are Entrepreneurs need to know what cash flow is, yeah. what VAT is, um, what legal structure they should think about, how to recruit somebody, how to avoid a, um, a ending up in the small claims or tr uh, employment tribunal. Mm. Just basic execution stuff. So I thought, I'm gonna make a few videos. So I ended up making a flipping business course, which was 76 lessons, 10 and a half hours, nearly killed me. Yeah, I bet. I'm quite into attentive, right? So I wanted to learn the content, the content workflow. Yeah. So I built the set, learned how to light it. You built the set? I recorded it myself, learned how to do Premiere Pro on YouTube, nice. edited the whole thing myself as well, put it on another platform, yeah. Teachable, and then did the whole thing myself. So I learned a lot, but it was hard. And then now I give it away when you join Moblox. But that's what entrepreneurs need. You know, you need a bit of sizzle, yeah. a bit of inspiration. Yeah. But then execution, as you know, is hard. And that's why doing business on TV is very hard. Yeah. Because most of it's really quite tedious and yeah. boring. Absolutely. Uh, the, Absolutely. The it's the pitch, fundamentals. The pitch is the highlight of the yeah. next 10 years of your life. Yeah, and I think that's why it's so difficult to take a business to that scale is because you need to have, obviously, that executional excellence, but you also need to be able to inspire. Inspire yeah. top talent, inspire investors, inspire customers. Piers, it's been super interesting. I've got a few questions that I'd love to ask yeah. you. So my first question for you is, is there anything that stands out to you as the single biggest risk that you took? And what was the outcome of that if you did? Um, I probably wasn't in business. My biggest risk I probably ever took, if you're looking externally looking in, was walking out of a very well-paid job in the city as an investment banker to start a dot-com. So that was always in me. And my mum said to me, probably even today actually, 20, 30 years later, when are you going to go back and get a proper job? <laughs> so I think, you know, you got a nice bonus, which gave you some wiggle wiggle room. Yep. But I think taking that bonus and literally resigning and walking out of Canary Wharf in London, the, that, the shiny buildings there, to start my first real externally funded business mm. was probably the biggest risk I ever took. We know how that one turned out. So there you go, it's a happy, very happy ending there. And on the flip side, is there anything that you can, is there anything you think about in your career? I think, you know what, I wish I'd done that differently. 
Can I do two? Absolutely. <laughs> so I'll, I'll do it quicker then. So the first one is chasing rabbits down holes. Okay. So when you start out, you think this will work, this will work, this will work, this will work. And you know the ship, the ship's got been punctured below the water line and you're sticking anything you can into that hole and you know it's not working. This ship is going down. And what you try and do is just kind of stick more stuff in the hole to save it. Don't, you know, just realise the ship's sinking. Fail fast. And, and that's, that's not... I don't mean just going out of business, just all sorts of, it can be trying to keep somebody in the business that wants too much money and you can't afford them. And I think, oh, should I pay them that? No, let them leave and find somebody else. There's lots of ways you can apply this, but don't chase rabbits down holes sometimes, just fill them in and move on. And the other one really is, is about, I work with some, I won some tenders for very large companies, mm -hmm. telcos actually. Um, spent two years working on it in a startup business, mm -hmm. won the tenders. And I never got them to, there's all these big numbers, raise money on the back of it. And they never, I never got them to pin down and say, okay, if we do all this, if I, if I industrialize my business for you and raise the money to do it, I need some revenue certainty. And I never ever asked for that. And they never got to market and that business didn't really work out too well. So what you should have done is stand up to very large suppliers or customers and say that we're a small business you need to protect us if we are going to serve you. And if you can't do that, walk away. That is amazing practical advice. That is something which, you know, we see hurt so many small business owners and it's... So hard though, because they're like, oh, well, big contracts. Yeah. And you can raise money in the back of it. But if they, they want to get to market for no reason. I mean, I had a meeting with them where they said, um, two years late to market, right, just quickly. And they said, right, we'll be in market. I'm making, making, the, making the months up now. We'll be in market in July. Mm -hmm. so I'm like, okay, I can just about get to July. You get to May, coming again. Duh, it's going to be October. We've changed our plan. Yeah. I can't get from July to October. You're killing me. Yeah, it's October next year. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, pens down. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's just the way they are. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's amazing advice. What does it take to be successful? A lot of hard work, I think. I think you've got to, you've got to, you don't need a good idea. That's a fallacy. You, just, yeah. you, just see, you can do something that the, the, the pizza area down the road, make better pizzas, um, and market it better. So you need a, a reasonable idea. You need to add value to someone's life. But then really it's about the hard work. And you hear this all the time, but it is really true. It's resilience. I mean, mm. you and I talk about it. We're raising money now, you know. And because I've been on TV, it doesn't make it any easier because you tend to, you're trying to raise stuff with a naught on the end of it. And it's hard work. It's keeping emotional it level hard work, up here. Yeah. Yeah. My partner's like, yeah. I don't know how you do it. You know? So neither do we. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, hard. it's just hard work and resilience, but you have to keep going. Yeah. Yeah, it's great advice. That, 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 those two mixed together is actually a competitive advantage. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right as well, especially now with how the rate of innovation is so just incredibly fast that even if you have an innovative idea, by the time you take it to market, it's no longer that innovative necessarily. It's all about execution, hard work, that grit, seeing it through very, very rarely is the initial idea, the end output. So it's that hard work that's gonna see you through. So I think that's, that's great advice. My second to last question for you, Pierce, is what are you most proud of? Um, so I'm probably most proud of making people that have worked for me wealthy actually. So seeing someone who's come in quite junior, they've moved up to the ranks. I'm a big believer in promote within. Promote people that aren't quite ready. Mm -hmm. Don't go externally and find people that give you the big one because they've got the right CV. It's the hunger actually makes, a ma makes up for a lot. And then to see them, I don't mean hundreds of millions here, but just life changing money for, their, for them. I think that's something which I'm hoping to do again. Yeah, it's amazing. We literally had um, Nick Telson on uh, just before you, who said the exact same thing, okay. exact same thing. So yeah, I think it's, uh, but it, it's a common term with a lot of entrepreneurs, right? It's because no founder is an island, no business owner is an island. It's all about team. It's the team that gets you there. It's the team which are there with you on the long nights and the, the, the hard days and everything else. So yeah, I think it's such a... Um, you know, they're the ones that are loyal and stay with you for thick or thin. The ones that say, look, I know you pay me X. I can actually get two X in the market, but I'm going to stay. Yeah. Um, I want a few more options. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah, it's um, great. That's how it but, works. But that that is important. Yeah, absolutely. Pierce, my last question for you today is: fifteen-year-old Pierce walks in right now, standing in front of you. What are you going to tell him? So I would be believe in myself more, I suppose, 
people look at people look at my background and they look at me on LinkedIn, my CV, and it looks like a natural progression mm -hmm. because I climbed a ladder. So by the time you get to the top of the ladder, you've got a ladder. But when I was at the, the, the bottom rung, I kind of believed myself, quite blinkered and determined, but nobody around me really understood what I wanted to do. And it was more just, and now there's more, there's more content out there. The there was no internet when I started out. It's just, if I sort of believed I could do things and I would have probably got where I wanted to get a lot faster, I was always had some doubt in my mind, a slight chip on my shoulder. And I think, and that's those voices. And those voices, it's not, it's not your voices. Mm. It's the people around you telling you that, oh, you sure you want to go on that journey? That's not going to be easy. People like you don't make it in those places. And if I just not listened to them and cracked on, I am not covered as much, just being me. I probably would have got to where I wanted to be a lot faster with a lot less risk in many ways. Because time, in my, in my world, time I did risk. Just doing things quickly and moving. And that's something that um, you often see young people have it. They, mm. they, they have all that um, support and yeah. confidence that I, I kind of pretended I had it actually. Yeah. yeah, that's an amazing answer. And Piers, thank you so much for sharing today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure, thank you.